Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining with us this morning. It's lovely to have you here with us uh, as we meet together uh, on this Sunday morning uh, in the middle of April. I uh, hope you're all keeping safe and well, and I trust you'll be blessed and encouraged uh, as we all meet together here this morning. Um, let's just take a moment and we'll commit our time together this morning to the Lord in prayer. Let's just pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. And Father, for your blessings, Lord, that we are reminded of our new every morning. Our Heavenly Father, even in these difficult times, we are we are so much to be thankful for. We're reminded that you are a friend who sticks closer than any brother. Uh, that you love us so much that you sent your son to die on a cross for our sins. And even just in the last couple of weeks when we've been thinking again about Easter time and the great sacrifice that was made for each and every one of us, Father, we just... We just lift our hearts up to you and we give thanks and we rejoice um, for a saviour that was sent to die for our sins. Father, we, we, we look around us these days, Lord, and, and there are many things that could drag us down and, and give us cause for concern. But we are reminded that we seek after the one who provides all hope. Father, we thank you that you love us. Thank you that you continue to be with us, that you help us uh, in, in, our, in our lives on a daily basis as we, as we seek to live for you. Father, we pray you'll give us the strength and encouragement and help. And Lord, just a desire just to keep on walking with you. Uh, and Father, that as we, as we, even this morning as we meet together, that our hearts will be, Lord, just full with joy again as, as we think about all the good things that you have done for us, how you continue to watch over us. Father, we thank you. Lord, we just pray this, uh, this morning, Father, for each and every one who has taken part. We remember those that are uh, taking the re who are doing the readings, uh, we think of the one who's coming to do the kids' talk. Uh, and of course, then, Father, for, for Mervyn as he comes to bring us the word later on. We just pray that, that you'll be with each and every one. That you'll help them and bless them, Lord. And through, through uh, the things that they bring, that, that will be a, a challenge and an encouragement into the hearts and lives of each and every one uh, who has who's listened to this service today. So, Father, we ask for your help this morning. And we just pray you'll be with us and you'll go before us. In your name. Amen.
So just a few announcements for the week ahead. Before I get into those, I just want to say a special thanks to uh, each and everyone who's involved this morning. A uh, special thanks to Matthew and Joel who are bringing the readings uh, in a little bit, and also then to Gareth uh, for bringing the kids' talk. Um, so thank you to you guys for, for, for taking part and for helping out this morning. That's really, really appreciated. We look forward uh, to what you're going to be sharing with us. Um, special thanks as always uh, to Mervyn, um, for, for continuing faithfully to bring uh, God's word to us each and every Sunday and each and every Thursday uh, and we're truly grateful Mervyn for the work that you do uh, and we don't often get a chance to thank you so it is nice again just to take this opportunity just to say thank you we really do appreciate the work that you continue to put in uh, faithfully uh, each and every week for us and we thank you for that we trust you'll be blessed this morning uh, although you're, you're going to be speaking a little bit later on I know but it's just nice to be able to, uh, to get this time to, uh, to say thanks to you again Special thanks as well uh, to Coulter and Kathy Ann uh, for all their help with, with the music and putting stuff up online as well. Uh, and we thank you for that. We know that's a huge amount of work, uh, especially there with Coulter with all the online stuff. Uh, so again, we just want to take uh, just a moment and just thank you specifically for that. Our services continue online um, for Thursday night uh, for our prayer meeting and Bible study at quarter past eight. Uh, and that's Facebook and YouTube at 8.15 on Thursday night. Um, and we can look forward to seeing uh, what Mervyn's going to be sharing with us on, on Thursday night. So if you're free and can join with us or catch up at a later date, uh, that's Thursday night at a quarter past eight. So next Sunday the 25th, um, normally I'd be saying to you it'd be an online service, but it's actually what we're, we're reverting back to our format what we had at the beginning of the month uh, with a drive-in service. So that's the Sunday morning, the 25th um, of April. At 11.30 in the morning, it's going to be another drive-in service uh, in the car park in the church. So you'll come in in your car and we'll get you parked up and get you into a good spot where you can see uh, what's going on. You remain in your car for the duration of the service and we'll be broadcasting the service, the audio of the service into the radios in your car. Um, so that's this Sunday morning, uh, 11.30, the 25th of April, drive-in service in the church. We will be attempting again uh, to, to put that service up online later on in the day. Um, technology and time permitting uh, but that's the plan at the moment that we'll be doing that so if you're free on Sunday morning and um, this Sunday the 25th at 11 30 we'd love for you to come and, and join with us in the car park it, it was lovely just the last time we've done it uh, just to be able to see uh, people that we haven't seen for in some cases months uh, it was a it was a pleasure to be able to do that um, so if you're free come along and join with us uh, and if not then you can catch up later on online Facebook and YouTube and on the day there'll be there'll be more notifications about what times uh, those those services will be available. Um, but we'd love for you to join with us if you can uh, this Sunday the 25th, 11.30 for a drive through uh, in the car park in the church in Riffle. Hopefully we'll see you there. Now that's all I have by way of announcements. I'm going to hand over to Matthew and Joel for our readings. And they're bringing the readings from uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 verses 15 to 21 and 2 Kings uh, chapter 2 verses 9 to 13 
So that's Matthew and Joel are going to bring that. And then straight after that, uh, Gareth's going to bring us the kids' talk. So thanks very much for all your help. Um, and our readings now from Matthew and Joel. Thank you. Our first reading is from 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15 to 21. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over uh, Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimish king over Israel, and anoint Elisha son of Sahath from Abel Mehola to succeed you as a prophet. Jehu will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. So Elijah went from, the, or from there and followed Elisha, son of Saha. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driven the uh, twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come to you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke and his oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to the, cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Our second reading is from Second Kings chapter 2 verses 9 to 13. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elisha replies, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me when I am taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove the two men, separating them and... Elijah carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress. Elisha picked up Elijah's coat, which had fallen when he was taken up. Then Elisha returned to the bank of the river Jordan. Morning boys and girls, um, I want to tell you something today, I uh, want to begin by saying we got a we got a new addition to our house recently, um, her name actually is Mittens, um, so I want you to start to guess what you think she is, and before anybody tries to guess or anything, I, I don't name my car, so it's not a car, and it's not another dog, so what do you think, um, maybe I'll give you a clue. Mittens has got a very short but woolly coat. So what do you think? Yeah, that's right. So Mittens is a little lamb. You want to see Mittens? Come on over here, Jessica. Bring us in, Mittens. We see this. Look at Mittens. Come on over here. You want to go up on the table, Mittens? Huh? Look at this wee guy. Or a wee girl, actually. This is Mittens. So what do you think of Mittens, folks? Nice. Um, I was thinking as well, maybe you could help me out. Um, where's Hannah at Jessica? What would be a good wee friend for Mittens? What do you think? Maybe another lamb? Oh, there she's calling for a wee friend. Come on in now, this is Belle. And don't say it, calm yourself down Ollie, you're okay, you can stay away. So we have got Mittens and Belle, aren't they lovely? And they're the best of good friends, you know. They love getting on well together. So we'll let them run on and play now. Here, Jessica, come here and take muffins and go and have a bit of fun in the garden. And Ollie will probably chase them all around the place. All right, Ollie, are you going to sit with me? That's okay, you can stay here too. No, off he goes. So, Belle and Muttons are perfectly good wee friends together. You know, but I was thinking, 
what do you think would be or what animal would not be really a good friend to bell or to muffin? Apart from Ollie or dog, you know. Um, what about a wolf? You ever heard of a big bad wolf? Well, I think a big bad wolf would be a really bad enemy to a, to a little lamb. Because I don't think a wolf would play with a lamb at all. Um, I can't see it, you know, having fun with a lamb. It might actually probably eat the lamb, and that would be a big concern. I'm going to read to you a little verse from the Bible here. This is in Isaiah 65, verse 25. It says that the wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lions will eat hay like a cow, but snakes will eat dust. In those days, no one will be hurt or destroyed. So, I'm going to show you a little picture as well. So, Joel, can you see that little picture coming from my video, man? So, we can see a little picture here of a wolf lying down with three lambs and the verse says below it, again from Isaiah it says the wolf will live with the lamb so they live together in perfect harmony so I'm sure you know, you're like me, you can't really imagine that happening, can you? you know, we can hardly imagine Ollie running around our garden without torturing and hurting our little lambs but the, this image on the face of it seems crazy, but effectively it captures one of God's great promises. A great promise to create peace between natural enemies. Um, and also, when, when I look at this picture, it gets me thinking a little bit about, about us as people, about how we sometimes hurt other people. Maybe you've hurt your friends by being nasty to them, or maybe you fall out with your brothers and sisters and you've been fighting or arguing or just doing other stuff that's just not good. It's not in God's way. So what would, what would life be like then if everyone was at peace? If we didn't fight or argue or hurt people? <laughs> or, you know what, if we could go to school and there was no groups of cool kids and then everybody else and they all kind of didn't get on together? Or what if you were able to take the kids from the bad areas, the so-called bad neighborhoods, and they were able to play with the kids from the good neighborhoods in perfect harmony and perfect peace and got on really well? So what would life be like then? It would be different, wouldn't it? And what about us? What about you and me? Um, what about our issues? You know, imagine a life where we didn't disagree with other people. Imagine a life where we didn't fight or argue or hurt other people or say nasty things or tell lies or say one thing and then do another, that kind of thing. If we were in a place like that, then our life would be peaceful. And it would be peaceful because it would be always aligned to God's ways and doing the things the way God wants us to do them. For that matter then, let's go beyond our own house. Imagine the whole world. What would it be like if it was perfectly at peace? And that also gets me thinking that we know that God has created or plans to create and works on his creation on a perfect place called heaven for us all. And that place in heaven will be perfect, it will be peaceful beyond our imagination. It will be a place where there will be no more pain, no more hurt, no more nastiness, no more regrets, no more of all of that stuff that we associate uh, with life here on earth because of what we have done through sin. But imagine that, we should, it's hard for us to imagine, but we should imagine it, we should pray for it, we should long for that place in heaven. Um, but most importantly, we need to prepare for it. Um, as you were learning recently in Sunday school last week, um, we learned a big word called a big word called propitiation, um, and that's really to deal with how God, how Jesus can deal with our sins by taking the wrath of God upon Himself. Um, and that's what we need to do. We need to prepare for heaven by asking Jesus into our life, by giving our lives over to Him, so that He can take away our sins and that we can experience this perfect peace one day where the wolf will lie and live with the lamb. So I hope that all made sense to you. Um, in recent weeks I've done a few of these talks and I've been uh, criticised by forgetting to make sure that I say that your parents should give you a nice treat and some sweets now at this stage. Um, and maybe you're not, you're like us, you're not like Meredith, who's like a bucket of chocolate sweets there to hand out that we did there in the drive-in, but I'm sure you'll be fine somewhere in the house some nice sweets and treats for you for this afternoon. So take care and God bless.
Thanks, Matthew and Joel, for the readings. I uh, appreciate your help, uh, as, as always, guys, and to Gareth as well uh, for the kids' talk. Gareth's a brave man. Um, there's there's a, an old saying goes in, in showbiz that you should never work with kids or animals, and, and Gareth was elected to do both. Uh, so he's a brave man. I also say he's been reprimanded uh, from somebody I would not mention in the sweets. Uh, so hopefully, boys and girls, that you've got your sweets um, uh, shared out. I'm sure Mervyn has saved an absolute fortune over the last year not having to buy all these sweets. Um, to distribute among you. So we can only hope whenever we get back together that he's amassed a huge collection that he's able to share with us. Uh, so Mervyn, if you're listening, and I'm sure you are, save some for all of us. Uh, we're looking forward to getting back together and we can share in that. So we're going to put up one more hymn just now, um, Down at the Cross Where My Saviour Died. Uh, it was recorded back from the drive-in with a little bit of editing added in. Um, so we're going to put that up now and then straight after that I'm going to hand over to Mervyn. Uh, to bring us uh, the, the sermon uh, and then to close our meeting off uh, this morning. Thank you. Down at the cross where my Saviour died Died where for So, uh, folks, I just want to bow for a short word of prayer uh, before we turn to God's word together. 
And may I just say, please do remember in your prayers, uh, especially the drive-in service we're having next Sunday. Uh, God willing, I know it's coming up a bit quick, uh, but we've decided just to have it at the end of the month. And uh, we'll see how time goes uh, from that. So the drive-in service, 11.30, and everybody's very welcome to come along. We had spaces for more, and uh, we're, we're, we're looking to the Lord. It'd be lovely to see the car park full and to see people coming in. So you'll be very welcome if you'd like to come, and that's at half past. 11 uh, there uh, next Sunday morning that being the last Sunday in uh, April so please do uh, remember that now folks just bow for a word of prayer before we turn to God's word our loving and our gracious heavenly father we just thank you for all that has taken place so far in the service we do thank you for your hand upon us and we thank you Lord for the singing of these wonderful hymns for the little thought that was brought to the boys and girls uh, and Lord, just for the leading, just for the guiding, the direction upon our service, we pray, Lord, you'll bless as you have blessed the reading of your word. Now you'll bless to us the preaching of your word. We thank you that we're not only saved, but we're saved to serve. And we thank you for your great call upon our lives into different forms and different aspects of church life, of service for you. And we pray, Lord, as we look at Elisha's call into full-time service, we pray, Lord, it'll be a challenge to us just to be involved in your service in these days we do pray. So bless this little thought to us and we pray, Lord, it'll be a help and a challenge and a blessing and a deep blessing to all of our hearts because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Amen. Folks, just a, a quick recap. Um, we were looking really at God's call upon uh, Elisha and upon the others. Uh, and there really, I suppose, uh, we see God telling uh, Elijah to go and to anoint different ones for service. And the main one we were looking at really was Elisha, whom he anointed to be his successor. But Elisha had to learn under uh, Elijah. And that's the greatest way to learn. I thank the Lord for uh, being there in Abbas Cross for two years. Uh, under uh, the Reverend Lewis and Mrs. Lewis and, and, and the folks there in the church. And it was a great blessing and a help to me as I was able to just watch on and look on and, and see how church life was. And I know one of the greatest helps to me in church life and being in church life uh, was the great blessing and the great help that I got at that particular time. And Elijah was, or Elisha was going to receive that blessing as he sat under Elijah, as he watched how Elijah did, he was going to get a tremendous blessing and a tremendous input into the work before he had to take up the mantle. We looked at three things already. God's call often comes unexpectedly and to unlikely people. We see uh, Elisha there working in the field. We see him with the with the twelfth yoke of oxen. There was eleven yoke of oxen before him ploughing, and he was number twelve. And there he was working away in the field. Uh, and I'm sure Elijah was happy enough doing. I know coming from a farming background myself, I was happy enough doing and working on the farm. But then God's call came upon his life to to leave the farm and to leave the plough and to go into full time service for himself. It it was unexpected and it was unlikely you know here was a man plowing he he wasn't in in in, in some of the fancy bible colleges he he wasn't a, a, a master's in theology or a, or a bachelor's or a doctorate he, he didn't have any of these degrees and folks please don't think this morning i'm making fun of them they're they're important to those who, who have them in the work and it shows diligence and it shows study uh, but folks the reality was he was just a simple man unlikely man maybe as he was out there plowing and unexpectedly the second little thought we looked at was god's call is always clear definite and uh, i suppose in many ways uh, it's in god's timetable and folks what we looked at it was very clear and it was very definite and the reality here for him that God made it so clear to him. Elijah came to him. Elijah said, follow me. And he said, look, you're going to be doing a work. And, and that's the wonderful message of the gospel. When God speaks to us and, and puts his call upon our lives, folks, that call is a tremendous thing. That's what he said to disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So it was clear and it was very much definite. The third little thought and the last thought we looked at last week was God's call usually comes when we are faithfully doing our present task. 
And folks, there's no greater work for you to do than, than what you're actually doing now. And folks, I know when I said, and I said last week, you know, I was happy on the farm, I was working on the farm, I was, I was busy on the farm, and that's where God called me. And I, and I do believe here we have a man who was busy, who was plowing, who, who was 12th in, in row of, of, of plowmen. And folks, the reality was he, he was about his daily routine and he was busy. And you look right through, we, we have God's call upon Gideon. Gideon was out uh, threshing wheat in the wine press. He was working. We see David. David was out mining the sheep. We see Moses was out mining sheep. And God calls people who are busy and doing in their own workplace. And I think some of the things regarding that is the idea that, folks, if we're not prepared to work in the workplace where, where we get a good grounding, folks, then we will not be prepared to work in the work of God. And the reality is that's the great challenge to us. And it's a great insight to be out in the workplace and to be working. And as we move on uh, this morning, we look that God's call must be, must be heard before our service is undertaken. And the reality is that God has to come to you and God has to give you a call. Uh, Elisha did not appoint himself. He didn't say, well, look, I, I, I think I'll become a prophet. I think that's a good day's work to do. Uh, you know, th th there's nothing of that. Elisha was away. Elisha was doing his own work. He was doing his own job. And God called him. And it was only when he was sure of God's call upon his life that, that he left behind everything. And he'd have followed Elijah in obedience to the Lord. And what I want to say to you, we have to be very careful because what really does constitute a call from God or the call of God for service upon your life? What does really constitute? And folks, can I say there are a number of things that doesn't. The reality is the need is not the call. Now, folks, when I listen to missionary workers today, when I listen to Christian workers, when I listen to people from, from church life, there's tremendous needs. There's many even within our own congregational union. There, there are needs there for, for, for ministers or pastors in, in the different fellowships. Folks, there are needs there. When, I, when I'm involved in different mission organizations and different fields of service, there are tremendous needs there for missionaries to go. But, and folks, can I say, that's not only at home, but that's abroad as well. Because many of the missionaries who are working abroad come and tell us, listen, that there is great need. But folks, the need alone does not constitute a call. There is many needs, but it doesn't constitute a call. The opportunity is not the call. And can I say there are plenty of opportunities for service. And folks, if you look up some of the, the varied websites uh, for mission organizations, there, there are plenty and, and they are varied. Folks, within church life, there is opportunity. Within missions, uh, missionary lives, there are opportunities for service, both at home and abroad. But can I say this doesn't constitute a call. I remember the, the second year I was in Bible college and I was praying very much for, for, for where the Lord would lead me. And I remember Mr. Peckham called me into his office one day and he said, Mervyn, I, a man has come to me. He said he's a missionary in Nigeria and he's looking for, for someone to come and, and help in the work. And he asked me to, to think about who was in the college and, and see whether they would come. He said what he was looking for was somebody who was, who was practical. And he said, you know, I know you do a lot of practical work around the college. And he said what he is looking for then is somebody who will do missionary work as well. So it's, it's a very job. And he said, Mervyn, I thought of you. And, and folks, when I went away and I, I thought about it and I prayed about it, there was a tremendous opportunity. And in many ways, much of the work and much of the practical side was there. And, and, and I would have enjoyed that. But folks, I didn't believe that that opportunity was my opportunity. And the reality is for you, just because the opportunity is there, it doesn't mean it's for you. I remember somebody saying to me one time, and folks, can I say, be very, very careful in the Lord's work. They said, listen, I push away at the door. And I know the Lord will close the door if it's not for me. But can I say some people have pushed so hard, they've nearly kicked doors in. 
And it hasn't been God's opportunity for them. So be very careful. The opportunity is not the call. The ability is not the call. Folks, when I was looking at home and I, and I looked at many of the, the, the young people around me, they were far greater in ability than, than I ever would be or will be. You know, folks, the tremendous ability, they were more qualified. They were more qualified spiritually. They were more qualified mentally. They were more qualified physically than I ever was. And folks, can I say for the work of God, you need to be qualified spiritually. You need to know the Lord Jesus Christ personally. You need to belong to him. You need to be living a life for him. And you need to be involved in his work daily. Can I say, that's the challenge. And folks, physically, you know, you do need strength for, for the Lord's work. And mentally, can I say, even, even mentally, you need a mental, because there's a mental pressure. There's a spiritual pressure. There's a physical pressure in the Lord's work. But folks, can I say abilities and qualities? That's not the call of God upon your life. It doesn't constitute a call. So it's not the need. It's not the opportunity. It's not the ability. And it's not the invitation. You see, here we have a perfect example of an invitation. Because it was Elijah who came to Elisha. Now we know, and as we go back there uh, to verses 15 and 16 and 17, we can see there that, that there was the call of God upon three men. And Elisha was one of them. God told him, go and anoint Elisha. And that's exactly what he did in, in the latter verses. So God spoke to Elijah. And Elijah spoke for God to Elisha. But can I say, folks, sometimes people will often come to you. And they can use great flattery. And they can say, listen, you should be involved in the Lord's work. And some people will even say, listen, look, God has called you to do a work for him. But can I say, just because somebody brings you an invitation, they're not always an Elijah. They're not always right. And folks, there's more than that, the invitation simply to the work. They said, the last little thought here, the desire is not the call. And we may have a burning desire within our hearts. I remember somebody speaking to me years ago and they said, listen, I had a tremendous desire to be involved in the Lord's work. I'd love to be involved in the Lord's work. And more than one person has said that to me over the years, but God has never called me. You see, the desire was in their heart. The desire was in their life. They wanted to be involved and they wanted to be called, but God never called them. You see, what constitutes a call of God upon your life? First of all, the call of God is a deep inward conviction. I know when the Lord was speaking to me from personal experience, God, God spoke directly into my heart and into my life. Folks, I, was, I, I, I couldn't get out of a meeting, but I knew God was speaking to me. You see, when the preacher spoke, folks, I was under deep conviction. I knew God was calling me into his work. And folks, can I say the second thing? It was confirmed by the Word of God. You see, not only was there that conviction, I went to the Word of God, and there in Micah 2, as I've already said, Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest. It is polluted, and it shall destroy you even with the sore destruction. And folks, many times I have looked back in my ministry to that Word and that call upon my life. And anybody who goes into ministry will have the good times, they'll have the bad times, and many times they'll go back to their call of God upon their life. And the call is constituted by a word from God. And then the third thing is, you'll have a real peace in your heart. Whatever God has called you in, or whatever ministry he's called you in, whether full-time, part-time, just being involved, the reality is, folks, you will have a real peace in your heart. That's the third thing. I remember speaking to someone before I went to Bible college and I said to him, how do you know? And he said, you just know. You just know. You see, there's three steps. There was the inward conviction. The second step was the word of God. And the third step was, folks, I had a tremendous peace. Once I made that decision, I had a tremendous peace in my heart. That constitutes a call. Folks, can I say the fourth little thought here is that God's call, or the fifth little thought, sorry, is, is God's call is always to a difficult task. 
You know, to be involved in the work of God today, to be helping in the work of God today, it's a difficult task. There's many people who have said to me, Mervyn, if I knew what I knew now as far as the work of God is concerned and, and as far as being involved in the work, I, I, I would step back. I would step back. You know, but the reality is, folks, you can't step back when God has called you. Because if God's call is upon your life, you're called to a difficult task. You will notice I didn't say God's call is usually to a difficult task. I use the word always. Because when you're involved in the Lord's work, you know there, there are problems and there are difficulties and there are trials and there are tribulations. And in verses 16 and 17, you'll see the difficulty for, for all of these who were called. But especially for Elijah. Elijah was prophet. Elijah was God's man. Elijah was to, to speak on behalf of God. God was going to speak to Elijah. And Elijah was, or Elisha, sorry, was going to speak to the people. That was his task. But here, what did he to do first? He said that he had to, he had to kill all. And him that escaped the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. That was his first task. But that's a difficult task in, in any form or shape. And folks, the, the reality is, for you and for me, we're called to a difficult task. And can I say with the work of God, there's a spiritual battle. If you're involved in the true work of God, if you have a call of God upon your life, there's a spiritual battle that will be involved. There in Ephesians 6 and verse 12, that well-known verse says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And folks, that is the reality. That's the reality. Charles B. Williamson translated this this, this verse this way. For our contest is not with human foes alone. You see sometimes we think. Well you know there's trouble coming up against us from a human form. That's one reality. But can I say the greatest reality is this. It says here. But with the rulers, authorities and cosmic powers of this dark world. Against spiritual wickedness. It says rulers, authorities, cosmic powers. That is with spirit forces of evil. Challenging us in the heavenly contest. Folks that's the reality. Not only have we foes here. But there are spiritual evil. Evil forces may I say. All around us. Against us in the spiritual battle. Warren Wiersbe calls this Satan's helper. Satan's helpers. And folks, there are many of them. That's what brings us to our knees. We have two qualifications, I believe, to this difficult task. And very quickly, folks, stability and stickability. And I believe one of the things in the work of God that we do need, or two of the things, is, is just stability. We need to be stable. You see, even those involved in leadership and, and those involved in the past and those involved in, in missionary work, folks, they need to be stable. And when they're involved in the Christian work, you need that stability. It's stable or firm, steady, firmly established. It's not the reality. What we need in the Lord's work is those who are firmly established, those who don't change, those who remain the same. Stability. And then stickability. What does the word stickability mean? It means to attach, to cling to, an ability to endure, staying power. That's the reality. You see, faithfulness or stickability or staying power, that's what we need. And folks, I trust that you're someone who, stay, who has stability in their Christian life and Christian experience. And folks, for the call of God, you need the same. And yet in, in the Christian life we need stickable. We need to keep going. Sometimes the Christian life is not easy. Sometimes to be involved in Christian work is not easy. We need stickability. And when I was thinking of this, the verse that came into my mind is 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, or my dearly beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, be ye steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain 
in the Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, my dearly beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, be ye steadfast. You know, don't, don't get caught up in, in fits and starts and stops. In other words, you're not to be tossed around by the sea, tossed to and fro, as the scripture says here, there and everywhere. You're to be steadfast. Don't be taking fits at it and starts and stops and coming and going. That's not what it's about. Unmovable, firm, unshaken. And it means unshaken from temptation or unshaken from danger. There's an immovability. You know, you're firm, you're steadfast, your stickability is there. Always abounding, always engaged in doing the Lord's work or the Lord's will. It's not tremendous. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord because one day you'll hear the well done of God. One day you'll receive your eternal reward. Folks, we need to stick at it and we need to be stable. That's why Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. That's why Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Folks, it's daytime we need to be working because the night is coming, folks, and it'll all stop. C.H. Spurgeon, known as the Prince of Preachers, and Spurgeon said this, Activity is the mark of the Holy Spirit and should be the mark of holy men. Activity is the mark of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is at work. And folks, it should be the mark of holy men. You see, God's call in the sixth little thought here is always accompanied by an enabling. God will enable you for the task. And can I say very quickly, because I have another little thought I want to leave with you in closing as well. When God calls to his service, he equips you. You know, when I look back uh, uh, upon my years of service, and I look back upon my calling, God has wonderfully equipped. And a number of the things that are here, the disciples there in Luke 24 and 49, it says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye here in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. That's for the disciples. They needed the power from on high from above. They needed the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives to enable them and to use them in the service. And folks, the reality is, not only for the disciples, but for us. It says there in Acts 1 and 8, it says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. And it goes on to say in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. But ye shall receive power. And can I say we need that power for service. We need that power for service. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit, when you're preaching the word, takes that word. And he convicts through the word. And he convinces of salvation. That's the reality. And folks, we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our ministries today and in our lives today as pastors, as missionaries, as those involved in the Lord's work. That's what we need. We need that power. You see, there's too many preaching and they have no power and they have no authority simply because, folks, they're not endued with that power. They don't know Christ. They don't belong to Christ. They're not living for Christ. And they haven't the power of Christ in their life. Folks, when you know Christ, it says his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. The last little thought here is that God's call demands a wholehearted response. And there in verses 20 and 21, Elijah has a wonderful response to the word of God. And very quickly, three little thoughts in closing. The first little thought, there was prompt obedience. He, the call of God came with a prompt obedience. There in verse 20, and it says, And he left the oxen and he ran after Elijah. He wasn't going to let Elijah go. When Elijah put the call of God upon his life, and he threw his mantle over him. The first thing he did was he promptly obeyed. Now he went back to do certain things and, 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 and that was part of his call. But can I say first and foremost, he promptly obeyed. And he left the oxen and he ran after Elijah. 
You know, folks, when, when, when God asks us to go and God asks us to do something for him, we need to promptly obey, first and foremost. That's the challenge to us of prompt obedience. The second little thought here, with a determined resolve. Not only was there a prompt obedience, but there was a determined resolve. In verses 20 and 21, what did he do? He says, listen, he, he, he says, tell me, he, he, he says, and, and he left the oxen, ran after Elijah and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then will I follow thee. And he said unto him, go back again. For what have I done unto thee? And here's the challenge in verse 21. He returned back from him, took the yoke of oxen, slew them, boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave unto the people, and they did eat. And the challenge was, what did he do after God's call? It tells us that Elisha was prepared to go home. He was prepared to say goodbye. He was prepared to say goodbye to, to his own life. And he was prepared then to follow the Lord. And folks, can I say, that's a hard thing to say goodbye to your own life. It's a hard thing to say goodbye to your family. And it's a hard thing to leave home. You see, every servant of the Lord must be willing and ready for anything. One of the mottos of the, in the faith mission when we were there was RFA, and that was simply ready for everything. When I left home, we had what they call a valedictory service. And I believe there's three little things here. Elisha's was a valedictory service. He gave unto the people. It says there in verse 21. You see the people gathered around him. He had a, he had a fellowship meal with the people. A public farewell. Not only a valedictory service. But this was Elisha's public farewell. He gave unto the people. And they did eat. They ate. They had that fellowship meal. They had a public farewell. And this was Elisha's farewell to the old life. He took the yoke of oxen, slew them, and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen. And I believe this was, it was symbolic of his wholehearted surrender to the Lord. That's why we sing that hymn, All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee my blessed saviour I surrender all. If you look up that word surrender it's to relinquish, give up possession or power. Not only a determined resolve but the last little thought here folks with a humble dedication there in verse 21 the last little part says then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. The little thought that took me here was the word ministered. And if you look up that word minister, it means one who serves, one who waits on, or one who attends to another. I wonder, is that your call to service? Folks, are you ready to, to serve? Are you ready to wait on? Are you ready to attend someone else and their needs? And are you ready to minister to? The Reverend Harley in Bible College left us a challenge he was speaking on, on Matthew's Gospel. A wonderful, godly man. And the Reverend Harley said this. He said, will you be a doormat for the Lord? Will you be a doormat for the Lord? And I trust, folks, we'll take the humble dedication that we'll truly be ministers as we go around doing whatever God has called us to do, that we will truly be ministers for him, that we'll serve, that we'll wait, that we'll attend. And, folks, if it comes to the point that we will be a doormat for the Lord, that's the call of God. And I trust Whatever God called you to do for him, you'll not go back, but you'll go through. And you'll allow God to take you and use you and bless you in every way possible. Folks, we're just going to close in a wee word of prayer. Uh, may I just thank everyone who took part 
in the service uh, today. I really appreciate everyone who does so much for us in the service, and I want to thank you again. Please do remember uh, the open air or the drive-in service next Sunday, and pray that God will bless. And if you if you can come along, do come along. You'll be very very welcome. Uh, we can park around, and uh, there's plenty of room for cars there around the car park. So you're very welcome to come if you would like. Let's bow together. Our loving and our gracious Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again this morning for your wonderful hand upon us. We thank you for your leading, your guiding, your direction upon our lives. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you will just take this word, the word that was brought to the boys and girls, uh, your word as well as we read it together, as we meditated upon it with the adults. Lord, we pray that, that each and every one of us will be servants of the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. We thank you truly. Like was said by the, by, the, by the folks of old. We're saved to serve. And we pray Lord that our life will be a service to you. So Lord just take us now. Bless us. Part us with your blessing. Keep your wonderful hand of protection upon us. May your peace. The peace of God that passeth all understanding. Be in the midst and in our hearts. And Lord may your presence be with us. We thank you that you tell us. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. And we ask it all in your lovely name. Amen.
Since my